Hey gang, welcome to the Gill Athletics Connections podcast, where we bring you the stories of track coaches from around the world. I'm your host, Mike Cunningham, and it is my honor and privilege to bring you the stories of these men and women. This week, I've got a doozy for you. DJ Hicks of Houston Baptist University joins us. Uh, Got this one scheduled really on the fly and was so happy and proud uh, that DJ would spend some time with us here. A great young coach who is from the Houston area. A lot of Houston uh, love running through this young man's veins. So uh, really uh, fun to explore Houston, its culture of high school and collegiate track and field. And uh, just to learn more about DJ and the, uh, the good things that he's doing and are sure to do in the future. So uh, without further ado, please help me welcome the wise and the wonderful DJ Hicks. Hey, DJ. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Oh, man. It is going as well as it can be uh, with everything that's going on. I heard you're on, uh, uh, well, it's not fair to call it house arrest, right? But you're at a homebound. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. I am we, are, um, we are all under a mandate by the mayor that we have to stay inside. So everybody yeah. is um, sitting at home. You know, they, they're allowing people to, um, this is obviously in Houston, Texas, they're allowing people to make trips to the grocery store and um, minimal exercise. I'm not really sure what exactly counts for. <laughs> um, yeah, I have no idea. But um, say you can't bring any exercise equipment outside. You can just, if you want oh. to, you can go for a run or something. So that kind of works out for me. But yeah, just hanging out at the house. How are you doing? Uh, really good. Yeah, I'm waiting for, you know, there's uh, the internet never loses, right? So all the memes that are going yes. on and everything. <laughs> I'm waiting for some uh, creative track coach to do a video of a six foot baton and have a, <laughs> do a relay there for social distancing. Uh, well, we're getting ahead of ourselves though. That's the current day. Uh, DJ, I'm oh, yeah. so happy that you uh, spent some time with us here on the Gill Athletics Connections podcast. This is a lot of fun. You and I have met once uh, at the factory. Yes. You came and yes. visited us. You were teammates with one of my former, uh, now former teammates and you came to visit us in Champaign, Illinois. Yes, I did. So um, Christina is her name. So Christina Mm -hmm. and I were teammates at um, HBU Houston Baptist University. And um, in May of 2016, I was coming back to Houston. So that was me just finishing up my first year as in Valparaiso in Indiana. And um, on my way back home to Houston, I was I split the trip up into two days. So I was going to stop halfway in Memphis and then just finish Mm -hmm. the rest of the way. The next day, and I love track and field, so (laughs) I wanted to, um, I know, I knew at that point, I'm not sure how long Christina had been working um, Mm -hmm. uh, with Gil, but um, I just knew that that was somewhat on the way because I was traveling south, Mm -hmm. and I just wanted to stop in and get to see everything that goes into um, making the sport that I love and (laughs) what all is um, involved with that, so it's funny because I had an amazing time, and I got to see um i got to see the the pole vault stress test where you put it in the uh-huh. machine and you do that and that was really cool and um by the time i was done that day it was it was probably four o'clock in the afternoon and when i was leaving indiana the first thing that i plugged into my gps was just the um the the gill factory like that's that's the first thing that i did and i didn't take into account how far off course that was going to put me from getting to from getting to Memphis. I just completely dismissed that. I just I'm just going to plug in the Gill Factory. I'm going to go there, and then whatever happens after that is going to happen. And then once I was done and having my good time, I found out that I had taken myself um, four and a half hours off course of my 17 hour drive back to Houston. Oh. So yeah, <laughs> but well, I had a so great time. I have an outsider slash insider perspective right so we we get guests every once in a while and of course not everybody can get here to east central illinois and champaign illinois where uh, where we are here with the factory uh but every guest that comes in uh track guest they they leave just talking about how awesome it was so i have that uh perception but it sounds like maybe it's it's the right perception You, you just had a blast huh yeah yeah i'm getting to see the um I don't, I don't even know how to correctly explain it, but the, um, 
the new hurdles that have mm-hmm. the little the you, you click them down with um it's the i guess the the um the pin if you will is directly under the crossbar mm-hmm. of the hurdle mm-hmm. And I don't know, that was just cool, you know, because that, would, that yeah. took me away from getting my fingers caught um, in the little <laughs> holes trying to move hurdles up and down. So I thought that was really cool. And I got to also see the um, the starting blocks that were like the size of that our size paper was an eight and a half by 11. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, that's that's that. I, I definitely didn't need all that for my foot, but it was pretty cool just getting to see that. So, yeah, I I always describe it to coaches who haven't had a chance to come into the factory. It's a little bit like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory for track coaches exactly. uh, with the different machines. And uh, like you said, you know, you're not even a vaulter. And I, I, I'm not either. <laughs> um, I, I would have told, I would have said the exact same story you did when I first visited for my interview uh, now a long time ago. Um, okay. The, the most fascinating thing to me was the, the pole vault, like how they make it and they stress test. That was just, you know, it's just so out of the ordinary for someone who doesn't know how they make vaulting poles. So it's just super cool. So, um, but there's so many different machines and, you know, uh, it's spitting out discuses over here and hurdles over here. It's just, uh, it's, it's fantastic. So I'm glad you, you had a good time and uh, definitely appreciate you coming to visit us. And uh, so would you endorse if someone is in the East central Illinois, Chicago ish area recruiting, would you endorse someone coming down to visit us? Oh yeah, hundred percent, definitely. Um, awesome playground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's yeah. It. Well, I appreciate that. Don't come now, though, right? That's yeah, right. stay at home. Stay at home. <laughs> visitors, visitors are not allowed, unfortunately, during this time. So, hey, so DJ, really interesting. We were talking before we started recording here. Uh, boy, you are Mister Houston when it comes to <laughs> track and field. Uh, you were born and raised in the area and uh, grew up running track in the Houston scene. Now, Houston, Texas, first of all, is amazing for track and field. Houston itself is uh, just maybe double down even better. What was it like growing up through middle school and high school, racing against some of just the the top kids in the nation? Yeah, yeah. So I, um, like I said, Mike, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas, and um, I spent um, most of my time in Missouri City, which is one of the um, suburbs, it's in Fort Bend ISD, right outside of the um, main city. And just going throughout middle school and high school and all that stuff, it was just so amazing. Um, well, at the time, I didn't know it was amazing. I just thought it was the standard for everyone. You know, just being <laughs> a kid, you know, I was I was a sprinter. I've been a sprinter all my life and every um, ever since I started participating in track and you know, just going to um, middle school meets, and I remember a particular person um, that I knew they could run an FAT, um, fully automatic time, 10 second 100 in middle school. He ran 10 8, and I just thought this was normal, and I thought this is what everybody did. And I thought there was um, people in all places around the country, like, oh, you know, there's this one fast guy, one fast girl running these amazing times, and that's just normal, you know, and just. Seeing that um, and competing against that in high school and middle school and high school, and obviously I was not one of those people at the time <laughs> running 10 8 in middle school. I don't even know how old you are in middle school. What is that? Um, yeah, 12, something like that. But just running that fast, I thought that's what everyone did. And just once I started getting older and once I got um, into high school, I was just like, wow, there's a lot of people doing a lot of really amazing things, and for some reason. It seems like a lot of the um, relay categories of four by one, four by four and the open sprints and the hurdles, a lot of the people that are doing the best in the country for the men and women are from the greater Houston area for a lot of things. So it was um, it was really fun and it was really challenging at the same time because, you know, I'd like to think that it made me a better athlete just getting exposed to such a high level of competition so early because I figured that um, if I can, a lot of times it was me getting embarrassed by those athletes because I wasn't running. <laughs> I wasn't running 20 points in the, the 200 or 21 low in the 200 wow. coming out of high school and um, just doing running 46 and 47 um, coming out of high school. So I actually have a funny story. When <laughs> I was in, and I'm not going to remember all the names of the people, but my um, – My junior year in high school, Fort Bend ISD district meet, I think it was junior year or sophomore or something like that, but 
Sherrod Evans, and if you're from the Houston area, mm. a lot of people know who he is. He was one of the um, really good sprinters in that time that was coming out of the Houston area. But he was running 20-point um, on the usual at various tracks <laughs> around Houston. It was just something he did. And there was a couple of other people re- people running really fast, and I just remember – being in the district final my junior year in the 200 and back then there was just um there was no area meet so i know in high school now they have an area meet but back then it was just district regionals and the state meet so it went three from district two from regionals and obviously so on for state and just two for state from Mm -hmm. each region and then i think a wild card in there and to get it out of district that year and mind you this is district so Fort Bend ISD so it's all it's about eight nine or however so many schools located in um, probably within 10 15 miles of each other and um, to get out of this small area of 15 miles it took a 21 low to get out so I remember I don't remember the specific wow. times but I remember Sherrod ran 20 point no problem and then there was two other guys that ran 21 low and I don't know I think I ran like 22 mid or something like that mm-hmm. and I was just thinking wow I didn't get out of my district meet because it took a, a 21 <laughs> three to move on to the next round so that was just some of the stuff that I had to deal with but like I said I think it um, it just made me a lot better because it just introduced me to um, pretty stiff competition at a young age, and um, it also introduced me to disappointment at a young age. So I really got <laughs> and that. And how to deal with it. Yeah, that. I just had to deal with it. That's the important part, is how to deal with yeah, it. Yeah, so mm-hmm. it was good. But most college coaches listening right now hear 21-3, and they're like, oh, I, I would die for that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. What, what are you, you know, being around Houston now for a long time, uh, and we'll get to where you, you, you also went to school in Houston, mm-hmm. college in Houston, and then came back, and that's where you are now. But, uh, but even before that, when you talk about the 10-8 eighth grader and the uh, 20 point kid and, and really 20 point kids, yeah, <laughs> plural exactly. uh, there, what do you, what do you attribute that, uh, that success from there in, in the Houston area? Yeah. You know, I'd say, um, honestly, I just, I'm bringing down to two things. In my opinion, it's uh, number one, you can't um, remove yourself from the fact that Houston is the fourth largest city in the country. And just with that being said, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of people in the city and the greater Houston area. When you talk about, Cypress, um, Fort Bend, uh, Missouri City, Sugar Land, um, and just all the surrounding areas. There's so many. Um, there's a lot of kids. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of kids. And then just for a second point, just we have the weather on our side where the high schools and just mm-hmm. um, in training in general, they have such great weather on their side. You know, it's probably cold two weeks, two or three weeks in Houston. And that being cold probably doesn't count to a lot of other people in other places in the country. <laughs> You know, so it, what's the coldest it gets D- during the day? What's the coldest it gets during the day? Uh, man, it probably in the in the quote unquote dead of the winter in Houston. Mm-hmm. Um, it I mean, it, it might get into the 30s, you know, but it's 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 30s with the sun out. So it's not it's <laughs> it's different from 30s with no sun and the wind blowing excessively hard and all these things. So it's. It's different, you know, but I just think that having those two things makes you have the um, you have the opportunity to train a lot. You know what I mean? And you don't have even if you're right. if, even if you don't have uh, the track that you want to go to or this or that, as long as you have the sun shining and you have the weather, you can you can make your own opportunities. You can just find somewhere to train. So I think um, that and also, I guess, for a third point, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of coaches, um, high school coaches in the Houston area that really know what they're doing. DJ, did I lose you? Um, can you hear me? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Hello? So you're talking about these it's just crazy fast times, 10-8 in middle school, 20 point to win. Uh, obviously, something's a little bit unique down in Houston. What, what do you attribute these, these, uh, these kind of fast times to? Yeah, well, honestly, it's just two things in my opinion, maybe a third thing. But um, 
Honestly, you know, Houston, um, just being in Houston, which is the fourth largest city in the country, there mm. are there are so many really talented athletes in the city, and there's just the surrounding area of Houston. You know, you have Fort Bend, um, Cypress, um, just th- there's a ton of places, and there's a ton of um, – there's a ton of athletes doing great things. And also there's a ton of high school coaches that are doing really good things, you know, with Mm -hmm. um, everything that's going on with all the coaching certifications and all the access to various um, learning material on the internet, you know, and just, um, I mean, high school coaches and college coaches, middle school coaches, everyone has such a greater level of education. So it aids in the opportunity for people to run really fast. So, Honestly, so the, that number one and number two, just the fact, like I said, there's a lot of high school coaches doing great things. And also the fact that we have weather on our side in Houston. You know, <laughs> yeah, it, you do. <laughs> it, yeah, it only honestly, I'd say it probably in, in the dead of the winter in Houston, you can put that in air quotations. Um, it, prob- <laughs> it probably gets to 30s, 40 degrees, you know, and that's with the sun out. So it honestly really doesn't count because you still have that coming down on you. So it just provides the great um, opportunity when all these things are going in your favor to produce some really fast times because you just have a great opportunity to not miss many training days. So you, uh, you were born and raised in Houston and you're, you're, yes. you're in Houston now. When you went to Valpo for your grad work, was that the first time you saw snow? It was the first time I saw real snow, let me say. So <laughs> <laughs> we have um, actually a pretty funny story with that. But we um, in Houston, probably twice growing up, we've had these instances where, um, you, you know, you get the little flurries coming down and, oh, it's snow. Let's have a snowball fight. We're mixing. Um, <laughs> we're mixing. um this ice that's melting in our hands as we're picking it up with um, dirt <laughs> that's already in the ground and we're calling those snowballs. And it's like, no, it's just a dirt ball you're throwing at each other. But yeah, that was, um, I mean, honestly, it was the first um, chance that I'd ever, or opportunity that I ever experienced snow. So when I got there, um, I arrived there in August and from August to November, um, August to Thanksgiving, when I went home to visit my family for Thanksgiving, it had not snowed and all the coaches there and everyone telling me there was, wow, this is very unusual that it hasn't started snowing yet. And you're very lucky and all this good stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know what I mean? Like it's just, (laughs) hopefully it'll never snow. That's what I told myself. So maybe maybe it just won't snow. Right. So I, I remember this day. So when it was time for me to go home for a couple of days for Thanksgiving, I got in my car in Indiana and I drove to the train station and in the train when I was on my way to Chicago, cause that's what I was going to fly out of midway to get back to Houston. Um, it started snowing when I was in the train. So I see yeah. this happening for the first time and it's really coming down and it's, it's getting kind of bad and it takes me an hour and 15 minutes to get to Chicago from Indiana in that train, the South shore line that I was on. And by the time that I got to Chicago, it had stopped snowing, right? So I get out, I get on the subway, I do all this stuff, and I get to the airport, and I actually do not have any snow come down on me, period. So I make it home and everything, and I make it to Houston, I guess the rest is history, because it was probably 80 degrees when I got to Houston. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And um, yeah, I I just didn't experience any snow, but definitely when I got back, there was snow everywhere. Um, I experienced what salting the roads was because I had no oh, idea what yeah. that was. I had been to um, volleyball games at Valpo where they were um, there was they had advertisements for salt, I, I guess salting companies. I don't know, but just people mm-hmm. that would go around and salt the roads and everything. And I was like, why is selling salt a <laughs> <laughs> why why is that so important you know that it would be an advertisement and sure enough i found out that those were some of the most essential people to life um in those environments where i mean the roads can get so bad so yeah but um i i wouldn't That's say a... that i i dislike snow or anything but it definitely it gave me a different environment so well i can say i definitely do dislike snow. I grew up <laughs> in florida and Al- florida and alabama and uh you know i've been here now and champaign illinois for 15 years and i still i'm not used to it at all so, um that was a really good example <laughs> you talked about the salt guys that, yeah um, 
you know, why, why they're so important about culture. Uh, and you mentioned two of the more obvious things with Houston, obviously the population base, uh, obviously the weather for track and field is going to help. And uh, I'd like to touch more on what you were talking about with the coaches uh, that are down there. You know, I used to recruit Houston a little bit. So I used to okay. recruit uh, Katie, Katie, Houston, Katie oh, yeah. High uh, over there. Uh, so, um, uh, what's the high school over there? Not Katie High, but um, um, gosh, I thought I had two names to it. Like a, I keep saying Cypress, but that's not it. Is it another um, Katie High but, school? Uh, I, th- I think it's in Katie. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. pretty sure it's in Katie. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some great – back when I was coaching, 04, 05, uh, some of the better – there was a couple of seven-foot high jumpers there. I think they had a 20 foot long, 25-foot long jumper. Uh, Gary was the coach there um, and just did a, a fantastic job uh, uh, there okay. as well. But um, And then also recruited uh, Ivory Williams over at Beaumont uh, okay. when I was at Mississippi State. And uh, still one of the most fabulous home visits I've ever had. Awesome. They fed me. Family was just – so welcoming, so awesome. Ivory was such a great, uh, at that point, he was a kid. He was 17, 18 years old. But, okay. Uh, but, def- but definitely the coaches and the, the culture that they've cultivated there in Houston. Um, who are some of the guys and gals that maybe the average listener doesn't know who they are, but they're just kind of instrumental in the Houston scene for track and field? Yeah. So um, honestly, one of the people that um, I I think a lot of people do know, but but it's my former coach, um, Glenn McMicken, who was my coach when I was at HBU. He's really um, I know he does a lot of work with um, USA track and field, but he um, he just has been such a helpful um, asset to me and like getting to know a lot of people and just teaching me kind of the ropes of what it looks like. In track and field, you know, and and just a lot of other people that are just greatly involved in um, USA track and field and the USTF CCCA and all that good stuff. But there's just, um, I mean, honestly, just listing off names would be so difficult because there's so many, um, <laughs> there, there's just, there's a lot of people that really know what they're doing. You know what I mean? So you kind of yeah. have this thing where you, you, and I mean, I have not been coaching that long, you know, but I just, just mm-hmm. from being in um, experiences. So I, I, I coached at the summer track level for a little while and just seeing what people are coming from with some high schools, like, oh, you know this much about track and field. You know, these are some of the things you should be doing, some of the things you shouldn't be doing, and just having that knowledge and then have versus having someone that's coming from a coach that's very knowledgeable. And it's like, wow, it's like you kind of kind of sound like you've been in a college program. You know what I mean? Like you, <laughs> you, you really know right. what's going on. But, you know, it's just it's it's increasing the um, the I mean, just it's increasing the sport. It's helpful to the sport. You know, um, we're seeing faster times and um, Mm -hmm. higher heights and further distances and everything that we're doing in the sport. So it's really, um, it's really cool. It's really, it's really awesome environment to be a part of. And it challenges me on the daily just to get better and improve myself. So. And when you graduated high school there, you obviously now have the rest of the country, if not the world, uh, to go out to for college, but, uh, you decided, uh, to stay right there in Houston and, and was a, a sprinter at Houston Baptist university. Yes. Yeah. So I had an amazing opportunity. I mean, I had an amazing experience when I was at, um, HBU running for, um, coach T and, um, coach mm-hmm. Glenn, coach blade, coach Cesar and all those people. And it was just really nice. Um, because, so I was, like I said, I was, um, I was born in, I mean, I was born in Houston, but I lived in Missouri city, which is probably, um, 15, 20 minutes outside of, I guess, the proper city. And um, I, I wasn't really, I didn't spend much time in Houston except to go to Texans games and Rockets games and occasionally, you know, just, Mm -hmm. um, just do, you know, things in Houston, you know, the aquariums there and my parents would take me there every so often, but a lot of my life was um, centered around what was taking place in the suburbs. And, you know, some of the Mm. Um, just being in Fort Ben ISD, some of the, the greatest sprinting was happening out there, you know. So in in my bubble, that was the only place that existed, right? So when right, I went right. to HBU, that just opened my eyes um, to all that the city of Houston had to offer, right? So obviously, when it was uh, hmm. time to focus, and which was most of the time, um, it was all about school, making good grades. It was all about track, focusing and improving in that regard. But just you know, when we had free time, we wanted to go and hang out and just experience the city there is there are so many things to do there are so many awesome amazing restaurants there's so many fun attractions to do you know i always tell people 
uh, Houston isn't somewhere that you would say, hey, I'm going to take a – if you're coming from somewhere else, you don't – people don't take vacations to Houston. You know, it's not like – it's mm. not a, a vacation right, right. destination, but it is, in my opinion, one of the greatest um, living destinations, you know, just for day-to-day life. Mm. You know, there's not that many attractions that are going to – pull people from around the world. Hey, let me see this. Let me see that. But as far as just on the daily living, it's an amazing place to live. And there's so many great opportunities and just um, the university provided me with so much and just set me on such a great trajectory to be successful um, in whatever I wanted to do, because I didn't, um, like I said, I knew that I wanted to um, get involved with coaching probably by the end of my sophomore year at HBU. But I, I've, um, tried out a lot of different things before I arrived at that. And just the university provided me with those um, opportunities. So for that, I'm very thankful. So you, you kind of knew in your sophomore year of college that you kind of maybe wanted to be a, a track coach. Yeah. Um, what, what, did, what did you think your freshman year? Were you going to be a teacher? A yeah. Five, so five? <laughs> gosh, what did I, so there was a couple of things that I kind of went through that I wanted to be, you know, um, like a lot of people, um, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but I'm not smart enough for that, you know. So I found that out pretty early after. <laughs> I doubt that, after a few okay. science classes that didn't really go my way. I figured that that wasn't the best thing for me, you know. And then, gosh, what did I? So even though I said I I wanted to, um, I knew I wanted to coach by the end of my sophomore year. The idea started kind of come on. It started coming on to me just a little bit in the thought. So I was like oh, well, maybe um, think about majoring in physics, you know, because there's a lot of physics in track and field, and that mm. was a terrible idea. So <laughs> that, didn't, <laughs> that didn't work out for me. And then um, I – I so I, I, major, I majored in kinesiology from HBU, and that's what I got my degree in from there, my mm. undergraduate degree. Yeah. And that worked out really well for me, But and, I, and I, I settled on that degree by the start of my sophomore year but not coaching specifically, what I wanted to do was I wanted to be a, um, a chiropractor, right? So I know, I know oh, yeah. um, they have a lot of influence in the world of track and field, and there's a lot of opportunity in that in track and field. But my, and I'm getting pretty personal right now, but my hands are pretty sweaty. My hands run pretty sweaty. So I was like, I, <laughs> I cannot be a chiropractor and have sweaty hands because people aren't going to like that. So I moved away from that. DJ, when, <laughs> when you're doing an interview podcast, you try to think about all the things that yeah. may come up. Uh, you, your quote of, I have really sweaty hands, uh, you know, I didn't see that one coming. Buddy. Hey, it's, it's getting honest right now. <laughs> That's I, it, I, I take it. I, it. It's, it's important because it brought me to the career I love. So it's, it's all good. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Right. But um, yeah, yeah, I just, that's, that's important. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that wasn't for me. And then um, by the time I was getting, by the time I um, got towards the end of my sophomore year, you know, I was just looking um, a lot of things that happened in life, you know, and I was just looking at some of the people who had been uh, most influential in my life. And um, number one, of course, so it's my parents, you know, I have a really amazing father and mother and they just provided the world to me and they've been oh. so great to me. But also I would have to say second is the, um, the coaches that I've had throughout um, my entire life. I'm not even in just track and field, but other sports too, because um, huh. I'm probably, I, I don't think anyone else can say this, but I have never in my life had a bad coach. Not once, huh. not once have I ever had That's a bad coach. So I know, of people who have all these horror stories of, oh, this coach said this to me and did that to me. But just growing up, you know, playing um, basketball, I'm running track. Um, I actually played um, competitive roller hockey. That's pretty interesting. But um, I wow. did that in yeah. Houston, and um, I never had a bad coach at all. So every single person was a positive hmm. influence on me. And I just think about um, some of the people um, that had helped me through a lot of the um, struggles in my life and just – who are those people? They were coaches, you know, and they also, they get to be these awesome mentors and they also get to be these people that make me run fast, you know? So I was like, if I can do that, if I can hopefully be a mentor to someone, help someone um, succeed on the track, of course, but also help them in um, getting started however I can with their, whatever um, profession they want to get into and I can be a positive impact on their life in that way, I think that'd be pretty cool. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the power of a coach uh, can't be overstated. Uh, in today's world where youth need as many positive role models as possible with so much negativity coming at them, whether it's from the internet right. or people in their lives or broken homes and such, uh, that a track coach uh, can really be that positive outlet physically, mentally, socially, emotionally. Right. Uh, and so it's so awesome to hear that you had such great experiences with uh, coaches, not only just track coaches, but coaches in general through your through your life, uh, through your life growing up. You mentioned again, you're in your sophomore year. It started. That's when it kind of clicked over. You want to be a track coach. What what kind of switched for you that you're like, all right, this uh, was it just that culmination of everything or was there a uh, whether well, it was Coach T um, mm-hmm. Or anybody was it a certain event or something? What what, what kind of made the final click for you to start focusing that way for a career? Um, I don't, I don't, I, I wouldn't say it was one specific aha moment. You know, it was just um, mm-hmm. yeah. Usually it's yeah, not. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think it was just a culmination of all those things and just um, kind of you know because as you um, get towards, like I said, I was I had um, I had filed the degree plan of yes, I do want to be a kinesiology major and. Once you do that, they mm-hmm. start um, giving you a few ideas of, or I guess a lot of ideas of the various paths you can go within that. And I just saw coaching. I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. I know some coaches. They can um, they can help me out as far as navigating this. And that there's no better, I guess, network than to have those coaches specifically around me that I see every day because they, they did help me in so many ways. I'm getting started in my career. So, um, yeah. And you started, you know, most people, the, the traditional path is you get your degree, maybe you go on and do grad work or uh, before you get your first uh, part time or full time coaching gig. And you certainly went that way as well. But before that, before you even uh, finished your undergrad degree, you started working on some things towards your coaching profession. Future. Yeah. So I uh, my my senior year at HBU, I got my USATF level one and my USTF CCCA um, equivalent level one. Um, and those things were just so helpful to me. And they were also a little bit hurtful. And there's that's a funny reason I'll explain in a second. But they were extremely helpful to me because they provided me just with a, a I guess, umbrella understanding of everything. Right. So I knew I wanted to coach yeah. um, track and field and I was, I knew I wanted to coach sprints, hurdles and relays, but oftentimes I um, discover just from on looking that you might not get the specific opportunity that you want immediately as far as getting to coach the specific yeah. events that you want to coach immediately. So it was nice getting a, um, just getting to have, and obviously it was a very um, introductory level because there's, there's so many, um, there's so many de- there, there's such great depth of information when it comes to all the events, you know, but it was just nice getting exposed mm-hmm. to all those things. So, you know, if I, let's say my opportunity was, I didn't run the 800 in college, but if I had the opportunity of maybe getting to coach middle distance and I wouldn't completely have no idea what I was doing, if that was my first opportunity <laughs> that I have, but I, I say uh, it was also a little hurtful because the more and more I knew, the more and more I started to study, it kind of, it kind of spilled over to the track, you know, because in the past I was just, you know, I was the guy that I'm going to do exactly what my coach says and I'm not going to do anything else and I'm just going to show up and run. Right. But when you know all these things about energy systems and blah, 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 and all that stuff, when you're just trying to compete, it can kind of get into your head and it can kind of get you um, off of the thing that you should be focusing most on. And that's just um, executing, you know, so I had to deal with that for, a couple of months, but it, yeah, it definitely played out to be helpful overall in the long run. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a real, first of all, uh, kudos to you for having that self-awareness uh, about that. Uh, that's really interesting that um, your, your senior year, maybe you, you were pushing back against the coach a little bit. Or? Um, I wouldn't say pushing back. I think um, just, just, yeah. um, getting just just interested you know what i mean i always because like even now i currently have yeah. athletes who i i mean i've i've been coaching for a little while and you know i've experienced athletes that are pushing back mm-hmm. in a negative way and athletes that are just asking really interesting questions just to learn themselves about the sport and i have a lot of those right now and i i i hope i wasn't perceived as pushing back to my um coaches but just, you know, uh-huh. just getting to um, – just trying to understand the sport because I was interested and I wanted to coach. So just 
kind of finding a lot about I'm finding a lot about the sport and just getting to learn um, things mm -hmm. like that. But um, yeah, you know, it was just they're really convenient to me to take the classes because they were both in Houston and um, the USATF mm -hmm. level one was at HBU it was hosted on campus um, and coach T orchestrated that. And then the um, USATF um, UST, USTF CCCA was hosted at um, Rice. And I did that with um, coach Boo. So that was just, those were just great opportunities. So. Oh, I, um, I'm trying to figure out how many times in a row can I do a podcast and mention Boo <laughs> Shucks Nader <laughs> uh, oh, in yeah. a positive oh, yeah. manner because uh, you know what a what a great guy. Do you remember any of your teachers from the USATF I... level one? It was a while back now, so I'm putting you on the spot. Richie Mercado, Richie Mercado, yes, yeah. So he mm -hmm. um, taught my level one, and I also have my level two. And um, Lauren Seagrave taught my level two. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Those those are some legends. Yeah, I learned right there. a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of information. It was it was a great That's time. Awesome. Well, I think you should be applauded for as a high school or a college senior taking your coaches' ed classes and uh, coaches' academy classes. That's that's awesome, man. It really did. Uh, you know, you can say you have passion to do something uh, outside of once you get your degree and then you can show it. And that was certainly uh, you showing what your mouth was saying. Awesome. So that's really cool, man. I, I, I that's uh, that really shows a lot of your passion. You. I love that. So you get your degree in kinesiology uh, as yes. a Husky, uh, which again, makes no sense at HBU, <laughs> but we'll, uh, we'll just let that. Hey, we, we, ha we have uh, a Husky, and you go to where Husky too. And that, that dog is taken care of so well that yes, that poor dog has to be just sweaty. The, the Husky at HBU <laughs> has its own apartment on campus. Yes. Oh. <laughs> that dog is taken care of extremely well. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. So you uh, finish up there and you go to Valparaiso University, which is kind of neighbors of ours uh, right across the border in Valparaiso, Indiana. Yes. Uh, the Crusaders, right? That's if right. I remember correctly. And you do, your, you do your grad work there. So tell me, what were you studying for your grad work and what um, position uh, groups were you in? Yeah, so for? I, um, after HBU, I, I went to, um, I moved to North Carolina for a little bit and I worked at um, Athletic Lab as I interned under Mike Young. And then after that, I moved to, I got the opportunity to go to Indiana and at Valparaiso. I got my master's degree in sports administration and um, the head coach there and still the head coach is um, Coach Ryan Moore and the associate head coach is um, mm -hmm. James Overbo and uh, Mike Straubel too. And there I was in charge. Um, coach Moore just gave me such a great opportunity because here I was, um, I, I literally had just finished um, competing in my um, career at HBU. I was uh, 22 years old and he gave me the opportunity to come to Valpo and coach the um, sprints, hurdles and the relays. So it was just, yeah, it was such an amazing wow. opportunity because um, he gave me so much freedom, right? He gave me such a great opportunity to, learn and make a ton of mistakes and just guide me through that and just help me figure out and just navigate what it meant to um, coach at the collegiate level. So an amazing learning experience because number one, I had never, um, everything, um, everything that I had gathered in my time, in my, in my time, just before, once I had started studying the sport when I was in college and to the point where I had got this um, position Everything that I thought of as far as, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that for training was all designed for a perfect environment of 80 degrees with sun outside and all these good <laughs> things, right? This is, I was ready to coach sprints, hurdles, and relays in the sun, right? With people sweating and doing all these mm. things. So when I got to Valpo, it's obviously, um, it's not Texas, right? So it was, um, it was. That's right. Um, I think that's their official city motto, by the way. This ain't Texas. <laughs> nice. but, yeah, you know, it just, um, it gave me, being in Valpo gave me such a great opportunity to learn how to um, adapt, right? And just um, figure out ways to um, get people mm -hmm. to run fast, sprint, hurl, do all these good things, and just make practice happen. Um, I guess um, help my athletes um, succeed in whatever that meant for them on the track. 
despite not having the most perfect weather all the time. You know what I mean? So it was, um, it was, mm -hmm. it was, it was mm -hmm. amazing. And it was one of the things that I attribute to being one of the most helpful things in me learning what I know up until this point, just the fact that it wasn't, I didn't always have tons of space to um, get what I need to get done, done. Right. So I had to, okay, I have to do this. I have to figure this out. I have to change this and do that. So just having to do that, um, it was helpful, you know, just speaking about something like training for the 400 meter hurdles. I remember, um, my last year at Valpo in, um, 2017 In 2017, that was my last year. Um, the, the conference meet. And at that time, Valparaiso was in the, they were in the um, horizon Valley or horizon Valley, the horizon, the horizon league. And the outdoor track meet was held mm -hmm. at Youngstown state university. And I remember, yeah, I remember oh, yeah. this was the very first week of May. So I don't know, you know, the outdoor track meets or it's like uh, May 3rd, <laughs> 4th and 5th, something like that. So, you know, even though we're in Ohio, it's still May, right? I'm, I'm expecting, I'm expecting to get right. a little heat, right? Just something like that, you know, a little sun, something. <laughs> I remember the, the first, so it wasn't the first, we didn't start on the first day. The multis and stuff started on the first day, but the, the second two days of the, the second of the three days of the meet, um, the fourth and fifth, the Saturday and Sunday, it was out of the prelims, and I kid you not, it was 50 degrees outside, and it was cold and raining, and um, actually, no, I only back up a step. It was 30 degrees during the prelims outside, and it was raining, and it was cold, oh. and then the next day, it warmed up to a beautiful 50 degrees, but it was still, it was, it was so windy outside, <laughs> and it was just so tough, but you know, I just applaud um, everything that takes place. Um, I guess just everything in the north, you know, because it's, say. it's you, you do not have such great weather. And when you have weather, just like I've said before earlier on the podcast, it just affords you the opportunity to train and make fast times happen. But, you know, just seeing all those kids still run fast, still compete, still not complain and just show up and get it done and just – be successful for the individual day, despite the weather. That was really cool. And I will tell you, those are some of the toughest people you will ever meet in your life. <laughs> just being up there, just yeah. seeing just yeah. daily cold, I say daily, but just for a large chunk of the, of the year, it is cold outside and just show up and get the work done and don't complain. You know, if it's April and it's cold, we still have to train for the 400 meter hurdles. And there's ways to do that inside, but you know, it's, you, you want to work on some certain things and it's, it's really hard to do those indoors versus doing them on an actual outdoor track. So you got to get out there and make it happen. And just seeing um, people, athletes make it happen. was super impressive. Yeah. Uh, I think for certain stretches of the season, for sure, day to day daily is uh, the accurate description there. And I know every coach who's listening to this from the Dakotas, Minnesota, <laughs> Illinois, Ohio's, uh, Michigan's all the way up to the Northeast are just uh, nodding their heads saying, yep, that's what we deal with. <laughs> that's funny that uh, Houston having that uh, um, understanding. Yeah, I definitely that appreciate that's, that's I pretty definitely funny. have an appreciation for it. <laughs> oh, uh, it you, you always talk to your athletes about overcoming and adapting. This is a, that's a good example of a coach having to overcome and adapt to the uh, situation. <laughs> So you do two years of grad work there at Valpo and the uh, center of the world, Houston, the gravitational pull oh, yeah. is pulling you back. So you get the opportunity to come back to HBU as an assistant coach, which, uh, yeah, I've said this before. I'll say it every time. I have a huge soft spot in my heart for uh, alma mater alumni who come back and coach at their alma mater. I just think that is just one of the coolest things in the whole world. So uh, what was it like coming back and now coaching for your former? Oh yeah. Yeah. Coach. It was an amazing, I mean, it's amazing. You know, coach T gave me the, um, she gave me a call and she, there was the, there was an open position at the time and she um, let me come back and coach the sprint turtles in the relays. And it was, it's just so it's very cool getting to um, be involved with it because it was something that I did not too long before that, right? So just, and honestly, when I got back mm -hmm. to the university, the freshmen that were on the team when I was a senior were now the current seniors at the university. Um, that year when I got back. Yeah, so that oh, was, uh, wow. that was, that was really interesting because, you know, when I, 
when I realized that was going to be the situation, you know, I, I like to think that I was pretty um, mature in my senior year and I was a, um, one of the team captains at the, yeah, I like to think so, <laughs> but um, I was one of the, the team captains um, <laughs> there. And, you know, like I, I hope that I made a good impression on them in the year that I had with them as a, um, as an athlete, but I was just like, ah, oh, I don't know if these, some, the, the, the athletes are going to listen, you know, like I can, I can, of course, I'm the coach and I'm going to do everything that I need to do as a coach to um, help them be successful athletically and academically. But I can just I I can't imagine how difficult it would be for them to have someone that was once their teammate now being their coach. But and those were four individuals, two guys, and two girls, and they made that transition so easy for me because they were just. Yeah, they were just so oh, nice. good. When they found out that I got the job, first of all, they were they congratulated me. They texted me, "Hey, DJ, so happy for you." All this stuff, and then um, when I got there, they were just the the leaders of the team. You know what I mean? Well, the leaders of the um, sprints and hurdles group. They were just willing to, "Hey, guys, mm-hmm. I need you," because I'm I'm sure everyone that's listening to this podcast have heard a ton of quotes, and one of those being that you know it's it's one thing for and I think it was, I think it was PJ Fleck, the coach at uh, Minnesota that said this, I don't know if he coined it, but just the idea uh-huh. that, you know, um, of course a coach can say everything he wants to, I can lead as best as I want to, but until you have athletes that are working with you to help you in leading in their own right with the athletes, it's going to be hard to be as successful as a group, as a team, as you want to be. Right. So they, um, they did that for me. Right. So I, I led the group um, how I was supposed to. I did all that. And then I also told them, hey, guys, I need you to back me up with these things. I need you to um, advocate um, these things. I need you to just when I'm not around, when you're um, with the, the freshmen and the sophomores and you're um, when you're in the dining hall and we're talking about nutrition and we're talking about just lifestyle and what we're doing on the weekends, I need you to be my the voice of me away from practice and all that good stuff to help me out they definitely did that so yeah. it was really good but yeah you know it's just been excuse me it's been an amazing um opportunity being back this is currently my third year and um tier it would have been my third outdoor season but obviously <laughs> um, we're a little sidelined at the yeah. moment but um, all right. All right. yeah you know it's just been good um it's it's been really nice um getting to know even more coaches around the Houston area and just further um, working on my ability to recruit because I've come to find out that that is a tremendous part of being um, successful as a collegiate coach, just being able to identify talent and just um, kind of bring people in and just um, um, help them get better and just making sure that we're able to do that um, on all levels. So, How many 10, eight, eight um, not many, right <laughs> not many, not <laughs> many. I honestly, you know, I spend a lot of time, um, you know, the first thing I, I guess when I wake up in the morning, um, the first thing, a couple of, some of the things that I do is like any other coach, um, collegiate coach is number one. Well, I'm not checking TFERS right now or Mossblood for the sake of seeing the results of the fall, the previous day, but you know, um, just right. I, I'm pretty familiar most of the time what's going on on TFERS and on a mile split around the country because I stay pretty current. But I also know that mile split spends time um, putting the middle school stuff on. So I should check that out just to see if there is any um, 10 8 sprinters hmm. around. I'm sure there are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. What, what, whatever happened? Do you know whatever happened to that kid? Did he end up becoming pretty good or is it um, just going to stall out I... there? As far as you honestly remember. i don't want to i'm not sure i'm not sure i know he i know he was decently yeah, successful sure. in high school but you know when, with the bar that high with the bar set that high coming out of middle school it's tough to yeah keep moving forward from that but yeah I, honestly i'm not 100 percent sure what exactly that guy is doing right now someone i think he's a high jumper for auburn just put on twitter it's kind of becoming a little viral uh he put out there just the other day to inspire others out there. And he had clips of his freshman high school, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, his freshman PR (laughs) high jump was like four, eight. Uh, And then like sophomore was like five. Yeah. You laugh. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, Sophomore was like five and change junior six and change uh, senior six, 10 or maybe or something like that. Auburn, he jumped seven feet. I'm pretty sure I'm getting these marks off a little bit here, but, uh, but it was really cool to see, 
like because he pushed these all together in one little tweet video uh and, and showed nice. that came hey, in i just yeah eight. like but even you you're laughing right i mean come on four eight for a guy right and it's like yeah, yeah. I know, you know I'm, I'm a seven foot high jumper now and i think he's, he's at Auburn university and i saw someone retweet it and they said um uh i is it i didn't know it was possible to be proud of someone <laughs> i've never met <laughs> yeah i love i love the yeah it's just I, cool. I love those stories you know just seeing um people just do yeah. um because you know there's there's i mean it's not it's no knock on people that have a high amount of success early because there's people that i know i remember um just being from houston i remember when raven rogers was young and she's so good now you know what i mean she's been she's been really fast for a really long time you know and i just think of Raven, yes, Raven, yes. the half miler from yes, Oregon. She did. Yes, she, she came did. from Houston. She's been, she was beating up oh, on guys um, yeah. for a long time, for a very long time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, just stuff like that, and just seeing. Oh, I, mean, man. Uh, I was no amazing track and field athlete or anything, but you know, just one of those stories for myself. And this is another shot at myself that I'm probably going to kick myself for saying after the show. But I. <laughs> You you do remember yes, yes, you do I remember do. we're ready. recording I'm right ready. before you tell the story. Just, <laughs> um, okay, all right, go ahead, go ahead. We're, we're, so I am too. My, Let's hear it. <laughs> my freshman year, I went to um, Fort Bend Elkins, and that's in Missouri City, and um, very Houston area. My freshman year um, of high school, I there was a girl that was faster than most of the boys on the track team, and she too was a freshman. Her table, her name was Taylor Houston, and Taylor mm-hmm. ran. Um, I don't know what she ran. She ran like 23, six her freshman year of high school. Yeah. You know, so it's like, what am I supposed to do with that? You know what I mean? Like I was just, I wasn't, and thankfully eventually I I started running a lot faster than that. But you know, there was this girl that was making the state meet as a freshman and running 23s and, you know, just coming out to track practice and at Elkins. um, I don't know if it's still like this, but when I was there, the, um, the men's and the women's team was split up. So there were two different coaches um, running two different practices. Mm-hmm. And we would just see this um, girl across the track, tearing up the track and just being in constant fear all the time. That <laughs> so for some reason we were going to have to race her. And yeah, <laughs> but I, I, I did run a lot faster than 23, six, thankfully. <laughs> so 23, 23, man, she, it was fast for a freshman <laughs> high school girl. That's what I do now. So, no, I'm saying you said you ran faster than 23. Oh, 23. Faster five. Than 23 I six. I, I said so. What like 23 five? <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, uh, bring this back to coaching and you. You, you. It, it's really interesting that your college senior year, you knew you wanted to get into coaching, so you started doing things to advance your knowledge inside of the sport of coaching so right now we're in a dead period for recruiting we're in a dead period for coaching and meets uh we're in a dead period for everything as it relates to on the track stuff what are you doing right now to maybe be prepared and be even better for 20 yeah so um most of the time i'm spending right now is just even though it is a dead period right now you can still um you can still you can still look up people online and see what um what's happened thus far at the high school level because even though um, college got cut short at the indoor season once it got and I, and I know um, I don't know if D3 Nationals got to go did D3 did D3 Nationals get to go off for indoors or did they get okay oh, everybody did because oh no okay. everybody when Thursday, bloody the, Thursday when bloody Thursday came down uh, every okay I didn't know specifically because I knew when d2 took place and I knew of course when d1 was taking place but um, I didn't know for them but um, mm-hmm. yeah you know there um, up until that point I think there was probably a, maybe like a handful of universities around the country that had maybe participated in one, participated in one outdoor meet but obviously the high school season had been rolling for some time, you know what I mean? So there is a lot of, um, right. there's a lot of high school athletes that seasons got their, their season got cut short and they still want an opportunity at universities, you know? So just looking them up online, because obviously all that information is online and just preparing to get to talk to them. And um, just whenever that does come out, um, when that dead period eventually does end, um, hopefully, and we get to start bringing people into the university, just being, prepared for that you know what i mean um like i said we don't know when that's going to be but just kind of um getting getting that in the motion and getting right. working on that and spending a lot of time and doing that and just um 
making sure, of course, that um, our athletes that are on the team right now are being taken care of well and just keeping in communication with them, making sure that they're um, not going insane in quarantine and just, um, you know, um, doing – just um, <laughs> right. kind of staying in shape and just um, doing all that good stuff. And, you know, I, I have social media and I have a lot of my athletes on social media and just getting to see them um, – still in good spirits and all these um, whatever um, push-up challenges and sit-up challenges that are taking place. I'm like, oh, good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just getting to see stuff like that. But um, beyond that, um, honestly, just getting um, – uh, my, my goal right now is just to um, continue to get ready for the summer whenever we can get those things out to our athletes and just give them some summer training to get um, prepared and um, – get that out to them and also just um, getting ready for the next um, year for the fall, you know, just, we have the people that we have signed at this point, just um, kind of working and figuring how we're going to add them into the team and what their position looks like in their role. So just um, getting, getting, getting ready for next year, you know, but it's always difficult to do. I mean, it is kind of difficult to do that right now because everything is so up in the air. So it's like, when am I going to get to do this? I'm trying to put this date in motion, but I don't know what, tomorrow is going to look like the next six months and so on and so forth. Just, so just, just trying to stay on top of those things. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm super excited about next season. True. Uh, first of all, yeah. that's the only thing I have to look forward to. Right. Uh, but uh, you know, you're, you're going to have so many coaches and athletes that have been chomping at the bit since right. March of 20 at that point that, uh, uh, and, and I think maybe this is a little bit of a wake up call for athletes and, and maybe coaches uh, that were kind of going through the motions and didn't realize how special oh, yeah. this sport and uh, for coaches, their profession is it's, it's extremely special. Uh, so maybe this is a wake up call that people, you know, re-energize and reconnect with their passion for this uh, tremendous sport and profession of uh, coaching track and field. So I'm super excited. I think 21 might end up being oh, yeah. the best year maybe we've ever had uh, for college track and field and high school track and field. So I'm, I'm excited, man. I know you are, and you're going to be a part of that because you're going to have uh, kids coming back uh, and you're going to have them prepared and ready and roaring to, uh, to hit the track yeah. and do some fast things. So uh, DJ, man, I can't say thank you enough. So humbled you would spend uh, this much time with us here at the Gill Athletics Connections podcast. This is exactly what it's about. It is about taking uh, the stories of the young men and women out there like you uh, love that you're in your third full-time year, mm-hmm. but fifth, you know, counting your grad work of coaching, you have so much time in front of you. You're, you're, uh, you're barely <laughs> at the starting line at this age of your career. Uh, yes, and that's an exciting definitely. thing that should excite you, uh, to what, you know, 20, we were talking about 2021. You're going to do amazing things in 2030 and 2040. And it's hard for you maybe to think about this, uh, young, uh, but 2050 <laughs> you're, you're going to be preparing for a season and, and preparing, uh, young people to, uh, lead productive lives on the track and off. So, uh, I, for one, am Thank excited you. to see that career continue. And, uh, again, thank awesome. you so thank much you for, so much, for spending Mike. time with us today, man. Um, you have me on, this has been an um, awesome opportunity and it's just, um, I'm excited to listen to all the other episodes you guys are going to have rolling out. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Now, uh, now go wash your hands. Lots of hand sanitizer. <laughs> uh, see you. All right, Mike. Have a good one. That's thank it. You. That's it. See you, DJ.